Chapter Twelve of God's Fool by Martin Martens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon. Folderdoes Zonen. Hendrik Junior was nineteen and had entered his father's office the year before. Hubert, being more backward than his brother, was to remain a little longer at the School of Commerce. They had worked together originally until Hubert, not having passed on one occasion, had been forced to see Hendrik move into a higher form without him this separation had naturally caused a change in their pursuits their companions their hours and courses of work they had been compelled to go each his separate way and from being almost always together they had come to consider it natural that the one should not know for hours what the other was doing i wish you would help me with my work hank said hype as you used to when we worked together oh i can't bother said hank i've forgotten all that rot since i moved up it seems years ago since i learned it good-natured huip winced dutch boys talk dutch slang their repertoire is small and lacks the picturesqueness of english school talk still they are as convinced as their coevals over the water that there is a good deal rotten in the bill of fare prepared for their intellectual nourishment and the term used above can therefore certainly not be considered misplaced and schoolboy talk is untranslatable to the connoisseur it always seems delightful salt and bracing and ever fresh like a breeze from the hills of youth what a good thing it is that the mamma so seldom hear it it only reaches them as a rule through the medium of the young lady's schoolroom and from the lips of these it tastes like bottled sea-water and not a bit like bottled breeze no a girl should not talk slang she always knows she is talking it and therefore in her it becomes affectation while its very essence is unavoidableness in the boy's case it comes bubbling from the lips with irresistible simplicity and you feel that it is the harmonious vehicle of his thoughts it is keen supple gleaming and it strikes straight with the young lady whose governess is teaching her how to hand a parcel pooh do you remember that old fable hush let us be polite even to the slang talkster there once was a lion that went out walking in a donkey's skin and everybody noticed how much softer a donkey's skin is by nature than a lion's fables are wearisome things till you get to the moral and then they become provoking at least so i have always found them but most people whom I have questioned on the subject have told me they considered fables were very instructive, because they give you a much clearer insight into the faults of your fellow creatures. It is unfortunately hardly correct that Dutch schoolboys delight in slang. They have but few idiomatic expressions, and these are often of very unpleasing origin. Alas that they should make up for their deficiency by oaths. Then why, it may be asked, this dissertation upon the subject there was a man once who possessed a coat but no peg to hang it on so having honestly earned his coat he stole a peg he thought that the coat would hide the peg and so it did but as it hung loose in the air the detectives cleverly remarked that the peg must be behind it and they took the peg away and the coat and the man and upon the latter the critics sat down no i mean the detectives and so he died hendrik went into his father's office and he began to talk about exchange they call it the purse in holland as everywhere on the continent and elias had long believed it was a great bag full of money hung up somewhere and that his father and all other people's fathers went down to it every afternoon and took out as much as they wanted he asked why the racket children's fathers did not go down to the bourse Alias, said Hendrik, is an unutterable fool. The adjective was painfully true. Hendrik Jr. was not a fool. Even the many who did not like him unhesitatingly admitted that he was a smart young man. His father's old clerks beamed upon him when he sat down before his office desk, spreading out his spidery little legs on a magenta-coloured sheepskin and knotting his little black eyebrows as he struck a quick hand through a thick bundle of papers with an incisive let's see 
Folderdoe's Zonen was not merely a wholesale tea shop. It was a great house, in the best sense of the word, a social institution, and, to a certain extent, what might be called a tribal family. All those who were connected with it and its far-spreading interests were connected with each other. The mighty head of the firm, looming bold and sacred, in the far distance of his sanctum, behind glass doors that opened into the outer office, was Volderdoe Zonen incarnate. But the youngest errand boy, who stared timidly from the entrance hall as he came up with his message, across lines of desks and bended heads, towards a solemn silence where mortals scarce dare tread, felt that he, too, somehow, and in some infinitesimal manner, was Volderdoe Zonen, and rejoiced in the thought. Outside, where he waited, was a perpetual clamour of rail-cars, a babel of voices, the continual thud of heavy cases, the monotonous rush of ropes on the pulley, and men with grave, preoccupied faces passed him rapidly, going to and fro through the great doors. Inside was silence, except for the buzz of voices in the so-called stranger's office, nothing but the occasional rustle of a leaf or a fragment of a whispered conversation, as one clerk would step over for a moment to consult with another. Sometimes a handbell would ring with a sharp electric twang from the chief's table, and a name would be called out, in a clear and imperative key. Then some quiet worker would lay down his pen and pass through the glass division into the presence of his sovereign. The oldest of them never listened for the name which must follow that electric signal without a moment's quiver of expectation. It was the only occasion on which Volderusonen's clerks laid down their pens unwiped. And from the yard and the quays beyond it came the boom of the machinery, the rustle of the descending lift, the hey hoes to the horses among the clatter of hoofs and the whistle of whips, hour after hour, day after day, through the winter rains, when the great stoves were lighted inside, and round by the sweet, soft summer months, when all the windows were opened, and, amid the scents of tea and machine oil and lilacs, the twittering of the city sparrows broke in upon the ceaseless scratching of the pens. There was not one of them, from the oldest to the youngest, not the sparrows, rather the pens, but felt Volder du Sonen to be eternal, without beginning and without ending, like the world they lived in. Hendrik Lossel himself, they felt, though he was an incorporation and a symbol, was not the eternal idea, any more than William I or William II is the empire. He would go as he had come, and Hendrik II would come in his turn, and go also. But the unity of which all the busy workers were component parts was not dependent on any of them for its existence, either the greatest or the least. Hendrik Lossel, however, was fully conscious that for the time being, at any rate, the sceptre rested in his hand. Not that he allowed it to rest, he swayed it with that kind of impersonal government which is usually described as stern by those who are passively, and just by those who are actively connected with it. Disobedience meant instant dismissal. Obedience could not always mean immediate reward. That was unavoidable, and the management of so extensive a business required, you may be certain, a firm hand as well as a quick one. Office hours are too short for good work as it is, Lossell would say to some penitent, promising amendment. I can't pay for bad. There's no room for repentance in business, he used to remark. If you want to repent, I must leave you free to do so at home. Whoever might be head of his household, there was no doubt who was master in the office. Perhaps he found some sweet compensation in the thought. Who shall tell? And when he himself was found out in some omission, or some positive error? Well, that would occur at times, of course, and the moment was an awful one. It happened upon one occasion that a mistake had been made which involved a considerable loss. The confidential clerk who had to broach the matter to his master trembled in his shoes, not for himself, for the fault was Lossell's. The clerk had been in the office more than forty years. He had served old Elias long before anyone had thought of the present head of the firm. He spoke calmly, despite his tremor, politely, positively. The chief reddened, looked up with an uncomfortable glance, 
looked down at the papers before him. Yes, he said. Meneer Hopman, there has been an altogether inexcusable mistake. I am very much vexed, very much displeased that such a mistake should have occurred, and I must bear the consequences. The old clerk understood. It was Volderdoes Zonen scolding Hendrik Lossel. But Volderdoes Zonen did not send Hendrik Lossel away. The walls of the private room were hung with the firm's historic mementos, diplomas of honour, an appointment to the jury of a great exhibition, a framed and glazed letter from a European sovereign long since dead. They were spread out there as the captured banners adorned the chapel of a conqueror, and high above the monumental mantelpiece with its solemn clock sat enthroned the life-sized portrait of a Chinese grandee, a splendour of flowered silk under a pair of little twinkling slits of celestial cheatery, a Li Fu something, who had earned his highest button by robbing his imperial master in company with old Elias's father. This heathen Chinee was the tutelary deity of the house. He pervaded it, as such a patron spirit should, for old Elias had turned his father's friend into a trademark, alas, the illustrious dead, and everything belonging to the business, even the charwoman's dusters, that came out of their cupboard on Saturday afternoon, bore the image of the tea-honoured Mandarin. He was an actual presence. They believed in him, down at Volderdoes Zonens, and spoke of him and to him as if he really were responsible for the fortunes of the firm. The warehouseman had a superstition among them, laughed at, yet not altogether despised, that the great cases could not come to grief as long as the Chinaman label upon them remained intact. And when old Volderdoes celebrated his silver jubilee as head of the business, the whole of the staff clubbed together, big and little, every member of the vast family, the errand boy subscribing five cents, and presented him with a silver dessert service in which silver mandarins sat under silver palm trees bearing crystal dishes. There were any number of silver mandarins, fit type of the spoil which the astute Li had divided between himself and his Christian confederate. Judith Lossell spread them over her table on all state occasions, for she was a merchant's daughter and had a merchant's daughter's pride. Fiddlesticks, said Hendrik Junior. He believed in silver and in Chinamen but he did not believe in tutelary deities, nor, in fact, in any deity, whether adverse or otherwise. He did not even believe overmuch in Volderdoes At home he spoke of it as the shop, but not when any stranger was by. It was an unavoidable formality for making money to him, nothing more. Money was the one thing worth having on this beastly planet. If you could have got it without any trouble, so much the better— but as she could not, well, Volderdoes Zonen came handy. He considered himself especially praiseworthy for looking at matters in this light. He knew men enough who wanted money but were too lazy to work for it. He did not realize how great his wish for money was. Well, but he worked hard for it, and when the day's work was over he would go and spend his evening quietly at the opera, especially if there was a ballet or at one of the little theatres where you laugh without knowing why. And if he wanted other pleasures, he took them without troubling anybody about them, and there was never any scandal or unpleasantness in connection with young Hendrik Lossel's name. He was altogether a most estimable young man. There were many such in Koopstad. He quite forgot in a month or two that poor Hubert, still at school, was his twin brother. He thought of him, and soon spoke of him, as the younger son— and so indeed he was, though only by several minutes. He grew younger daily, however, in the new-fledged merchant's eye. "'That's your brother, ain't it, Lossel?' said a fresh chum, also a merchant princelet, when they met Hubert coming along the street with his books under his arm. "'Yes,' said Hendrik, with a good-humoured smile. "'C'est mon cadet, you know. He goes to school.' Elias also knew something, in his vague way, of the greatness of Volderdoes Zonen. He had grown up under the shadow of the house, and, as a child, before his troubles came upon him, he had played in the warehouses and watched the men at their work. The memory had remained with him, 
and would abide in his heart for ever, as those experiences of our earlier years become our companions through life. He did not certainly know much of the intricacies of commerce, but he did know, for his father had repeated it to him almost daily for many years, that Volderdu Zonen was a thing to be honoured and reverenced as the source of all good to himself and to all his relations. It was as if the merchant had set himself to inspire his eldest son with a cult of the historic name, he who left all impressions of religion or morality to a servant. Probably he had good reasons for his conduct, and could have told you why such strange conversations as the following were so common between him and the son who had attained to manhood, and who would live through his whole existence without ever coming into contact with that busy world in which the merchant dwelt. Elias, what is your father? Tell me, do you remember? Head of the house of Volderdoesonen, papa. The great house of Volderdoesonen, I mean. And what was your grandfather? He was the same, papa. And what would you like to be best of all, if you could work? I don't know, papa. I forget. Yes, you do. Impatiently. Think. A silence. Then, suddenly. I should like to be a doctor, papa, and make all the sick people well. No, no. You would like better still to be what your father and grandfather have been, would you not? Hank may be that, papa. Very well, so he may. Now you can't. But you ought to have been it. And it's the grandest thing in the world. But now you will like Hendrik to be it when I am dead, will you not? What would you do, Elias, if people came and told you, after my death, that you mustn't allow Hendrik to take my place? I would kill them, papa. The strong man clenched his fists and involuntarily spread out his massive chest. No, no, that is not necessary. But you would tell them that Hendrik must take it, would you not? Yes, papa, but... An expression of extreme anxiety. You are not going to go away, are you? No, I hope not. But listen, Elias, what would become of you if Volderdu Zonen ceased to exist? I should die of hunger, answered Elias rapidly and by rote, or else people would come and take me away and lock me up in an asylum, and everything would be very miserable and poor. That is true. You will never forget it? No, Papa. And the merchant went his way. It was like a catechism. Johanna, said Elias presently, why are some people poor and some people rich? Because it's good for them, replied Johanna, who was an optimist, or she could not have lived with the fool. And am I rich? asked Elias. Yes, or at least your father is. And are you poor? Yes. It seems to be very much the same thing, declared Elias, after a period of slow thought. I suppose the devil made the poor people first, and then God made the rich people to help them, and so he put it all right again. Johanna did not answer him. I am glad God gave us Volder du Sonen to look after us, he went on. It was very good of him and I shall thank him for it every day. And he did. It was a few days after the conversation recorded above, the last of many, that Hendrik Lossel's tenure of office as head of Volderdoesonen came to an end. I've got a pain in the left side, he said to his wife at breakfast one morning. Do you know, I think it must be something the matter with my heart. I felt it once or twice before of late. Oh, nonsense, replied Judith carelessly. How fussy you men always are. It's just nothing but a little wind. I know the feeling quite well. I've had it myself. He did not continue the subject, but presently got up to go to the office as usual. Mevrouw Lossel followed him to the door. Don't forget to look in at Ramakers, she said, and tell them to be quite sure to have the fresh turbot for Tuesday. It's a bad day for fish. I wish we could have had our dinner party on another day. 
"'I can't help it, Judith,' he replied a little wearily. "'As I told you before, I must attend the town council on Wednesday, and the meeting of the Chamber of Commerce on Thursday, and you won't have it on a Friday or a Saturday. So there you are.' "'Ah, well,' she said, with an injured air. "'In any case, don't forget.' "'I shan't forget,' he replied, and was gone. He drove out to Elias first this morning, as he noticed that he had plenty of time. He had made it a rule, from which he only deviated under stress of circumstances, to give his eldest son at least a few minutes every day, but he usually went to him in the afternoon. Elias was surprised and delighted to receive his father at so early an hour. This visit was a continual treat to him, the great event of his uneventful day. For Hendrik Lossel had acquired much facility in Johanna's method of conversing with the deaf man. Elias's method, as she proudly called it, for had he not been its inventor? And in his own peculiar way, the father was kind to his son. Kind almost against his will, one would feel inclined to say. It was against his will that he often wished Elias dead. It was against his will that he often treated him with generosity and affection. This unfortunate son was to him not so much an unpleasing personage as an adverse circumstance. But he did his best, he had always done his best, to treat him well, nonetheless. Papa, said Elias this morning, Elias tired, Elias often so tired, and forget words, Elias not talk much. It is one of his bad days, interposed Johanna who had been bustling about the room, getting things ready for her charge. He has been complaining of headache all the morning. When he has one of these bad headaches, he is very dull and stupid. I think they get rarer as time goes on, but, do you know, sir, I think they get worse. The father went up to his son and stood looking at him intently for some moments. Presently he groaned audibly, and then, turning suddenly away as if to hide his confusion, he said to the woman, he is a beautiful man. Indeed, that he is, Mynheer, assented Johanna energetically. A vision rose up before her of Hanky and Hubby, yellow-faced, sharp-featured, groomed and oiled and smartened up as she turned towards the silent, statuesque figure, motionless in its customary armchair, and stood gazing lovingly upon that noble Olympian head, with its glory of golden curls and a line of patient suffering over the closed and tranquil eyes. "'Good-bye, Elias,' spelled the father. "'Good-bye, Papa.' "'You love me after all, don't you, in spite of all?' "'Of course I love you, Papa,' Hendrik Lossel turned to go. The woman passed out and opened the hall door for him. "'You yourself look far from well, sir,' she said. "'Hadn't you better see a doctor, too, once in a way?' "'Oh, I'm all right, thank you, Johanna,' he answered, as he got into his brougham. "'If the boy becomes completely idiotic,' he muttered, as the carriage bore him away, "'he may as well become it without loss of time. It would be the best thing that could happen, I suppose, on the whole.' He almost invariably alluded to his full-grown son as the boy. What more was he? Nay, in fact, he was barely that. And yet— he was not a child, as other children are. The merchant's face twitched once or twice, as if with sudden pain, and he gave a sigh of relief when the coachman drew up at last in front of the warehouse. He thought to himself with a half-smile, as he let himself slowly out and crossed the busy threshold, that it was now more than twenty-five years since he had entered the office at that hour as a partner in the concern. Day after day, month after month, but for an occasional brief summer holiday at some foreign watering place, had he done what he was doing now. The same twist through the same side door and down the same passage. The same good days among yesterday's unchanged surroundings. He hung up his coat and hat on their accustomed peg. And then, in turning to take his place before his desk, he cast the same invariable glance towards the clock. And the clock marked the same invariable hour. He sat down and drew the day's bundle of business towards him. 
Hendrik would not be in for an hour or so. "'No use trying to make young folks give up old habits,' he said to himself. And then he settled down to the day's work. A packer had been turned off for carelessness and had appealed from his immediate superior to Caesar. Hendrik Lossell went into the matter as was his wont. He found that the man had indeed been to blame, though in no serious degree, but he maintained the dismissal, in spite of prayers and entreaties. "'Not time enough for good work,' he repeated. "'Still less for bad.' And then he returned to his own. And when Hendrik Junior came in about half an hour later, he found that our common master, Death, had touched the chief of the great house of Volderdoesonen, and dismissed him from his post. End of chapter 12